like to begin by asking, like, how many of you have actually seen a James Bond movie? <laughs> well, all but a few of you. <laughs> so, but even if you haven't seen a James Bond movie, can any of you, like, list things that you think make up a James Bond movie? Like, I'll check out shout outs. Like, just say something. <laughs> Action. Sure. Women. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Cars. Mm-hmm. Cool gadget. Yep. <laughs> Dreams. Yeah. Shaken not stirred, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which is apparently the wrong way to make a vodka martini, but <laughs> that's how cool James Bond is. He does it the cool way. <laughs> so even if like you haven't seen James a James Bond movie, you still have a overall idea of what makes up a James Bond movie. To start off my essay saying, it's, a challenge, it's challenging to give an overview on James Bond without bringing up the cliches with Bond, saving the world countless times with fast cars while managing to find another gorgeous woman to, woman to deduce. But those recurring story elements seem to be the main driving force of what is keeping the series going on since 1962. Based on a series of books by Ian Fleming, James Bond is the ultimate power fantasy for just about any person to indulge indulge, their lust for action and sex, defying their superiors, being impossibly good at gambling, and cars, which nearly all the 007 movies provide. However, getting past the iconography of what makes a James Bond movie, the series shows a convoluted history of how movies are made within the era from which they come, and how the previous movie can affect how the other movie would come out. There's one of the things that you'll notice going into each of the movies is that a lot of the movies seem to be an overreaction of how well the last movie turned out. If people didn't like the last movie, they would have <coughs> less of that in their next movie. If people did like the last movie, they would have more of that in their next movie. So, there were two movies before that, before the one that really started the whole Bond movie series. But the third movie, Goldfinger, was the one that embodied all of the Bond tropes that we all know today. And those tropes all are all, they all start with the gun barrel sequence, an exciting action scene that sometimes has nothing to do with the rest of the plot. An intro credit sequence with provocatively dressed women, James Bond seducing a girl for intel only to have her killed for betraying the villain of the story, Q giving Bond gadgets, Bond embarrassing Q, a new car, a female totally known as, known as the Bond girl, which I'm not sure if we can really call them anything else at this point. They're always the Bond girl. You have to put that around quotes, too. <laughs> a grandiose villain with a master plan that usually involves nuclear weapons, because this was during the time of the Cold War when the whole thing started. A hidden master layer, a brutish henchman, usually with a metallic body part. A battle sequence at the end and Bond defying his superiors. Usually, the movie ends where Bond eventually seduces the girl like right in front of his superiors, and he still gets away with it. <laughs> But these are the key elements of what makes up a James Bond movie, and I feel like the reason why they structure all these in this way is because all well, the film, of course, wants to make us think that being James Bond sounds awesome. Like I said, it is sort of power fantasy, which is why the series has gone on for as long as it did. The two movies before Goldfinger did feature a lot of the tropes that we know in Bond films, like um, Dr. No, 1962, which showed the evil master layer, which also involved nuclear weapons. And then 1963 was From Russia With Love, which featured more gadgets, but I'm seriously not kidding. Pussy galore. <laughs> like, another recurring thing about the Bond movies is that they usually, the Bond girl's names is something makes sex a lot or something. In fact, this is one of the main differences between the first two movies that were directed by Terrence Young and Goldfinger and the movies he directed. That Terrence Young could take the character seemed could, he seemed to be able to take the character a little more seriously than Guy Hamilton could with his movies like Goldfinger, where of course the Bond girl name is that. And then the next movie he directs, Diamonds Are Forever, features this scene where the girl is named this. <laughs> My name is Price. Peter Price. Mr. Price, credit's good. Good luck, Mr. Price. Thank you. I'll 
douchebag's mouth. Delaware Boy Job. Thank you. Hi, I'm Plenty. I'm gonna close you up. Plenty up too. <laughs> Named after your father, perhaps. Would you like some help? On the grass, I mean. It's very kind of you. So, yeah. Um, one of the later movies, another Bond girl that's introduced is named Holly Goodhead. Wait. I kind of wish I was making this up. <laughs> But after the success of Goldfinger came Thunderball, which was directed back to by Terrence John, who directed the first two movies. And while the Bond format was still there, um, you didn't have that inherent silliness that Guy Hamilton brought in. While Guy Hamilton had his Bond girls named, well, that. Um, Terrence John's Bond girls were named Domino, Honey Rider, and Tatiana. And Honey Rider might be a little suggestive, but it's not like it's a lot more innocent compared to the other names. So. Um, so while Goldfinger started the whole Bond formula and Thunderbolt was following that, the next movie to come out was You Only Live Twice, which is another film that followed the whole Bond formula. And there's not really much to add to that besides there's this secret volcano layer base, which was actually. They borrowed that in the um, Incredibles, if you can remember that. And the most interesting part of this movie that I can think of is that James Bond has to disguise himself as an Asian right in the middle of the film. Oh, wow. And that's what he looks like. <laughs> <laughs> I seriously wish I was making this up. <laughs> Shows how silly this franchise could get. But after the whole Sean Connery era came George Lazenby, who is actually Australian instead of British, which Sean Connery is, well, Scotland British. It's still part of Britain, though. Um, <coughs> and this one is a completely different movie than the the previous entries of the series. While the first couple of movies, you know, show James Bond as being the impossibly cool guy he is, Under Majesty's Secret Service actually shows James Bond as a lot more vulnerable than his previous Bond. This one's actually more of a love story with um, the Bond girl in this movie named Tracy, played by Diana Rigg. And this didn't seem to be one of the more popular Bond movies, especially with today, because for one thing, it's a love story, and since we have most of the audience for James Bond being guys, you know, <laughs> they can't deal with that. And it has a lot more sad ending than usual. As I said, how most of the movies would end with James Bond embarrassing his superiors by having sex with someone right in front of them. This one actually ends with James Bond and Tracy marrying at the end, but unfortunately, Right after they get married, the uh, Bond girl, Tracy, actually dies at the end, so it's a lot more somber, and probably nothing like anything at the time was expecting. So, after that movie, they went back to Sean Connery with Guy Hamilton, and that clip I showed you was from Diamonds, um, Diamonds Are Forever, which is the movie after George Lazenby's only entry. And it went back to the sort of silliness and the Bond formula that we are more familiar with. After that, though, came the Roger Moore era. It's actually a really good picture of him. <laughs> um, Roger Moore was actually the James Bond that was featured in most of the Bond films. And it kind of shows because, as you see, he's like really young and strapping. And, his first movie, Live and Let Die. He's very young and suave look looking. And that came out in 1973. The last movie he did came out in 1985. And he looked a lot older <laughs> than he probably needed to be, which I think was kind of one of the common complaints. But I think the most interesting thing about the Roger Moore era is that these movies, the James Bond movies, started to become a product of their time. 
1973 with Love and Let Die featured a predominantly um, African American and African cast with a lot of black people. And I think this was a way to exploit on the whole black exploitation craze during the time. And the year after that was The Man with the Golden Gun, which actually features a couple of kung fu action scenes. A movie that came out the year before that was Bruce Lee's Enter the Dragon. So you can kind of see how they would want to cash in on that craze with Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee was pretty big at the time. And a lot of people I hear talk about how awesome he is today. Um, another interesting thing about the Roger Moore era well, with the first two movies, at least, we have The Golden Gun and Live and Let Die. These two movies were directed by Guy Hamilton again, which I mentioned before that he didn't seem to be able to, he couldn't be able to seem to take the character as seriously as other people, as some of the other directors. One of the characters he introduced in these movies was a Southern police officer who played, played for complete laughs and to be just completely obnoxious, which J.W. Pepper, I think this was an attempt to make the series a lot less, you know, British or <coughs> snobby, which I think maybe some Americans might associate with Britishisms. But after that came out the more formulaic James Bond movie, probably because people were getting sick of how silly the franchise was getting, especially with J.W. Pepper. Um, but during the time when Spike Eleven came out, that was 1977. So, when a lot of you people think of James Bond, you probably don't think of anything like science fiction or laser battles or space wars, right? Well, in 1977, if you're a producer of these James Bond movies and you saw how big of a hit Star Wars was, which came out in the same time, you would have been thinking it because the next movie that came out after The Spike Who Loved Me was Moonraker. And they were actually advertising at the end of The Spy Who Loved Me that it was going to be a different movie than Moonraker. But after the craze of Star Wars, they had to cash in on that. And I have the other ones I've seen these videos. Skip ahead a little bit. Oh, And keep in mind, this isn't a James Bond movie. This is okay. <laughs> yes, this is. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, Star Wars. <laughs> um, I don't think the reaction to that that movie was very popular because the next movie was not only a little more formulaic in its um, story structure, it was also a lot more low key. It didn't have as many gadgets. The next movie was For Your Eyes Only, which came out in 1981. And it's not as grandiose as some of the other Bond films have been, but I'm not sure exactly what happened, but it sort of started deteriorating with the next couple of movies. And I'll try to say this with the straightest face as possible, but the next movie to come out in 1983 was called, and this was the title character of the movie, Octopussy. <laughs> yeah, I see a face <laughs> And that's all I really need to say about that movie. <laughs> 1985 was A View to a Kill, and that movie, I think people might have been getting bored of the franchise because that movie started to become a little bit more of a parody of itself, the James Bond series, with the sequence that even opens with the Beach Boys music for some reason. But after that came the Timothy Dalton era, And this was the time when people were trying to take um, James Bond a little more seriously again. Um, the movie The Living Daylights came out in 1987, actually featured another love story again. Um, 
this time with James Bond um, having his job to assassinate the character that he eventually falls in love with towards the end, or at least <laughs> he treats her nicely than like most of the other characters than the other Bond movies. And once again, this is starting to get a little more low key, not as grandiose as the other Bond movies. And I think the reception might have been pretty okay with this because the next movie was Licensed to Kill, which is probably the darkest, most gritty movie at the time. Um, it was the first James Bond movie to receive a PG-13 rating. And it even features a scene where a guy gets trapped in a pressuring chamber and his head actually explodes. And it was a lot more violent than most of the Bond films at the time. But at this time, License to Kill would turn out to be the lowest, gro lowest grossing Bond film in the history so far. And the next Bond movie wouldn't come out until six years later, which would come to the Pierce Brosnan era. And this one seems to be more of a return to the Sean Connery kind of James Bond. He's a lot more cool. He plays an awful lot more coolly and suave like Sean Connery would in his earlier films. And in his first movie, it would feature actually more of a character-driven story, as most of the other Bond films would actually be more about the plot and the gadgets and how James Bond would be awesome at all of them. Um, this one featured a villain named Alec Trevelyan, played by Sean Bean, um, who actually turned out to be an ex-partner at the beginning of the movie. And at the beginning of the movie, it looks like he dies until halfway through the movie, there's a plot twist where it turns out he didn't die, he actually survived. And he turns out to be the bad guy of the story. And this is also the first movie where the Bond girl in the film gets her own story. Usually, this Bond girl of the movie doesn't matter until James Bond meets her. But in this one, um, Natalia actually gets her own story, and the two characters actually don't meet until halfway through. So, I think this would be pretty much the return for James Bond until the next couple of movies, Tomorrow Never Dies, coming out in 1997, World's Not Enough, 1999, which, once again, the James Bond movies started to go back into the more silly territory. With Tomorrow Never Dies featuring a bad guy, he tries to control the world by controlling the news. And The World Is Not Enough that features helicopters with chainsaws attached to them. And then there is Die Another Day, which is infamous for its invisible car and this scene. Okay. Time to draw the line. Oh, he drew a line. I get it. Yeah, um, I know a lot of people who kind of consider this to be the worst Bond film. I haven't seen it in a while, just I remember those key scenes and honestly, like, if you own up to it, it's still pretty fun though. <laughs> so, of course, now we get into the current era. 
the modern Bond, Daniel Craig, the time period when, well, especially now, when everything's pretty much a reboot or a reimagining or a remake. Here it even features James Bond as, with an origin story where it even shows the first two kills he makes and how it even affects him. This is also, Kissing Royale came out in 2006, and the movie that came out before was, the last year was Batman Begins, 2005. And that was another series that, with the last movie going really off the rails and campy with Batman and Robin, and of course they would reboot the series to make it the more gritty and serious Dark Knight trilogy that we know today. And one of the fewer Bond movies that also features a love story with um, the best word land played by Eva Green. This one is completely different than the other Bond movies in that they try to make it more realistic. There's no gadgets, like there's, of course, the fast car because there's always that. And it shows like the sort of history of why James Bond became James Bond. It's showing a betrayal with um, the main Bond lead of the Bond girl of the movie. Of course, this was maybe was a big hit, and the producers thinking we need more of that. So the next movie that came out was Quantum of Solace, which a lot of people out here complain that it's more of a generic action movie, and even Roger Ebert hated it. In his review, he said he tried to um, interpret the character the way that would make a Bond, Bond movie, and he didn't think Quantum of Solace would say with this quote: "Bond is not an action hero." He is too good for that. He is an attitude. Violence for him is an annoyance. He exists for the foreplay and the cigarettes. He rarely encounters a truly evil villain. More often, a comic opera buffoon with hired goons and matched jumpsuits. And of course, with the Daniel Craig era, we're not getting that anymore, even though he did really like the one before that, Casino Royale. So, four years later would be the latest movie, Skyfall. This one's Probably the first Bond movie I can think of with any sort of major theme within itself, where people actually question James Bond relevancy now. I mean, James Bond has been around for a really long time. Not since he's been in the movies since 1962, and his character was created in 1953. Um, this was another. This was an attempt to try to get James Bond back to its roots after people would think to be the mediocre quantum of solace. And of course, it'd go back to Batman again with a lot of plot elements from The Dark Knight where the villain plans to get captured and he escapes and of course, bad guy stuff. Um, this is also the first reappearance of Q. Q is the guy that gives Bond all of his gadgets. And this guy shows John, James Bond's irrelevancy as Q is the computer hacker in this modern world and a lot of we know about Spy Today is more about computer hacking and Q even makes the comment that what James Bond can do like probably in a couple of weeks he can do it just one night in his pajamas. Um, there's a book called The Signs of James Bond that comments on the disappearance of Q during the Casino Royale and Compton of Solace saying that the disappearance of Q in the recent rebooting of the series has done away with a certain level of childishness in the Bond universe, as the, narr as the narration had to adapt to the new, decidedly harder and more mature trends of modern action cinema, which leave little room for seriousness. Of course, I think the modern trend right now is to make everything more serious and grittier. But even with their bringing back Q, they still found a way to fit him, in, fit him in into the new modern world. But, of course, by the end of the movie, we still find James Bond relevant. I mean, they're still even making another movie, which I showed a trailer of. So, after this, um, I think I have one last picture, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it pretty much covers the whole overview of James Bond. Um, of course, we see when I wrote this, um, I didn't really know which what the new movie was going to be, but it looks like they're bringing it back to the more 60s era with Spectre again to have um, Blofeld. Spectre was the main bad guy back in the 60s, or the main bad 
fill in this group. <laughs> um, but with as long as James Bond has lasted until today, it seems like James Bond will always return. So maybe within another 50 years, we'll still have more actors playing him. <laughs> Who knows? All right, thank you. Thank you.